this week on Reigning in Life Through Faith. I don't need a book to tell me how to treat you because the love of God tells me that I don't misuse you or, mis or mistreat you. Thank you for tuning in to the Reigning in Life Through Faith broadcast. Let's join Dr. Mills as he begins part one of a new teaching, Righteousness of God. Jesus is Lord. You know, you can believe that he's Lord, but then do you believe that he, or have you made him Lord in your life? The difference is not whether he is Lord, but is he Lord of your life? Amen. Today I want to talk about something that um, I really haven't talked, I really haven't uh, given a message on, so to speak. We have it in foundation. And the Lord has been, has prompted me a few weeks ago. I really needed to talk about this. And you can title today's title, Righteousness of God. Righteousness of God. When we look at the scripture, everything that I can see in scripture has to do with God's righteousness. Matthew, the sixth chapter, and verse 33 says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Well, let's look at that for a minute. Matthew 6. Because before we get to that, there are some things that God is pointing out. Jesus is talking about, and we, we looked at this the other week, and the first thing that he says is, um, therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life. Do not worry about your life. Oh, that's big time right there. Do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? And when you read that, you really have to think about what Jesus is actually saying. Because we get all tied up in things, material things, and think that material things is life. And we center our life around material things. And when we don't have material things, all sorts of things start happening because we begin to worry And our bodies wasn't designed to be able to deal with worry. Our bodies was not designed to deal with worry. And so the first thing he tells us, do not worry about your life. And of, and of if no one else should be able to understand this or walk in this. It should be at least us who are, who say that Jesus is the Lord of our life. If Jesus is the Lord of our life and he told us don't worry about life and we're worrying about life, then Jesus must not be the Lord of your life. Amen. I find that we, um, we get too wrapped up in this world and the things of this world. And so therefore what the Lord tells us not to do are the very things that we do. 
Because this world is not designed to cause you to be at peace about anything. Everything about this world is to destroy you. We are in this world according to the word of God, but we are not of this world. Too often as Christians, we allow this world to dictate to us how we conduct our lives. Are you with me? And Jesus is telling us, don't worry about your life. People go into depression and oppression and all of these things that control them because they are worried about this life in this world. The reason that Jesus came is so that we can have a different life. And obviously he came so that we would have a life that we would not worry. And so as Christians, we have to examine ourselves to see whether or not we really trust God the way that God wants us to trust him so that we are not over in this area of worry to where our bodies are being broken down because it cannot, it cannot, it doesn't have the capacity, our body does it, to handle worry. Are you with me? He said, look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bonds, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value <laughs> than they? Are you not of more value? Do you realize that God is obligated to take care of you. He created you, therefore he is obligated to take care of you. Are you with me? Verse 27 says, which of you by wearying can add one cubic to his statue? Worrying is the opposite of faith. Worrying is faith for what you fear. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When I have faith for what I fear, it's worry. In other words, you have more faith in the thing that you fear coming on you than you do on what God said. You have faith for not having enough. And God says, don't worry. Okay. This is not my message, but I'm just getting down. I'm trying to get down to where I need to get started. <laughs> Are you understanding what I'm saying? So he says here in verse 28, so why do you worry about clothing? <laughs> you know, in the olden days, and I don't know a whole lot about the olden days, but I know enough. <laughs> People didn't have as, as, as many choices to make as you all do. So they didn't have a whole lot of worry. People concerned about 
which outfit to wear. When you only have one or two, you ain't have to worry about nothing. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the kind of background I came from. You understand? On Sunday, you understand? You only had one suit. So it wasn't no, you weren't worried about what you were going to wear. You weren't concerned about what you were going to wear. It was right there in front of your face. <laughs> <laughs> Some of y'all, you got so much, and the whole, the much that you have is what's causing you to worry. Do I look all right today? Did I get the right thing? What shoes am I going to wear today? Did I put the right pair of shoes on today? Well, we were talking about being thankful. Some of y'all can't be thankful for what you have because you want more. Amen. You don't realize how much you do have. Amen. Got too much, as a matter of fact. Anyway, let me just go on. I want to get down to God's righteousness. <clears throat> he says in verse 28, says, so why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil or spin. And yet I say to you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now, if you read about Solomon, you understand Solomon, Solomon had some stuff. That, that boy was so rich and, had, and his stuff was looking so good. The people who were around him, the people who took care of him, he had them dressed so, he had them dressed so that when the queen came, she was in, enamorated about what she saw with, with the people who were around him who were serving him. His servants. So, I mean, you know, God don't mind you being dressed. He don't mind you having. Just don't want what you have to have you. Anyway, he says now, now if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you O oh, ye of little faith. Will he not much more? Let me ask you all something, see. One thing that I understood <clears throat> about God is that all I have to do is to say, I, this is what I want. This is what I desire. And God will give it to you. I found that out. Now, it may not be in your timing. But I found out that there is nothing that God will withhold from you. Amen. Amen. Those of you who walk uprightly before him, there ain't nothing God will not, that he will withhold from you. Not a thing. Not a thing. No matter what it is. Amen. Glory to God. And so he says now, Therefore, verse 31, therefore do not worry saying, do not worry what? Saying. saying. See, uh, um, as long as you think about something, it's not too bad. But when you say it, because the thing captures you and overtakes you when you say it, because your words will produce in your life. Your words, the words that you speak will produce in your life. Now you go around talking about, I don't know what I'm going to wear today. What am I going to wear today? Oh, have mercy. Well, that's a sign of worry. You ought to know what you're going to wear. Therefore, do... <laughs> what happened? I heard a whole lot. 
out here. <laughs> yeah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Any of y'all ever ask God what to wear? I know, I know, I know. I got, I got some people I've heard before say, God doesn't have to dress you and tell you what to wear. But I just, I just want to know, anybody ever ask God what to wear? Yes. Yes. Yeah. If you listen very carefully, the Spirit will tell you what to wear. Yes. And he'll tell you, he'll tell you the combinations. And all of it that you have, if, if you let him purchase it for you, he knows exactly what you got. Amen. Amen. Anyway, for all these things, the Greeks seek. Well, no, I better back up to verse 31. Therefore, do not worry, saying, oh, what, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all these things, the Gentiles seek for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Now notice where we're at now. All of this that you're, that you're worrying about, God knows that you have need of them. And then he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. Amen. If I seek first the kingdom of God, don't worry about what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to wear, but if I seek first the kingdom of God, all of what I want to eat, all of what I want to wear, all of everything that I have need of, the word of God says God will add it to me. If I seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. We've talked about kingdom, you understand? Kingdom is, in fact, where the king's domain is. The king's domain, of course, is in you if you've allowed Jesus to take up residence on the inside of you. The king's domain is inside you. The kingdom of heaven is in you. But then he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness, I may know where the kingdom is, I may know about the kingdom, but my conduct in the kingdom is, a, is righteousness. My conduct in the kingdom is a conduct of righteousness. Do I know what is right? How do I know what is right? Because a lot of us, we go by what we've learned, what we've seen in this world, and we determine what is right. Our righteousness, God says, is as filthy rags. He doesn't want us operating on our righteousness. He wants us operating on his righteousness. He wants us to know from his perspective what is right and what is wrong. Not from yours. Not from what the news media says. Not from books that you read. Television programs that infiltrate your mind with all kind of propaganda. What is right? How to live right. How to think right how to do what is right based upon what God says is right and what's wrong. That's what he's saying, seeking. Seek what is right that I say is right. What I say is wrong. Now, that may go crosswise with you. God's right and God's wrong. Nevertheless, it is what it is. Amen. Now, the fact that Jesus came 
and died and laid down his life is an indication that man was wrong, God was right, because he came to make man right. The, um, the first covenant that he made with Israel, with Abraham, that the Israelites was to enter into as well, was a covenant so that men could be right with him so that God could bless men. In other words, he designed a way that if you do this, if you follow me, do what I want you to do, then I'm going to bless you. That's what we told, told Abraham. He said, look, I'm going I'm to bless you and I'm going to make you a blessing. He said, now you got to do some things for me. Leave your family, leave your, na leave your father's house and all this kind of, and come and I'll show you. And the word of God says he went and didn't know where he was going. He was just following God. So because he did not know where he was going, he, was just, he just believed God. The word of God says God counted that as righteous. He counted it as righteous because he was not righteous in and of himself, but God counted it as righteous. So therefore, because God counted it as righteous, God could then legally do some things for him. But the Word of God tells us that if that old covenant had have been all that it was, if, if something wasn't wrong with it, he never would have bought in a new covenant. So the new covenant came in because the old covenant wasn't really able to do exactly what God wanted it to do, which was to make man righteous. Not just be contributed righteousness to man, but make him righteous. Are you all with me? Making you so that doing right and knowing what is right to do is, is, is just a uh, first thought to you. It's, you don't, it's not something that I've got to ponder over. I, I, you know what is right to do. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And, it, and he wanted it coming out of you. He didn't want it from the outside going in as something that oppresses you or presses on you to cause you to do right. He wanted something on the inside of you that made you just automatically want to do right. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So when we talk about new covenant, we're talking about a whole nother process that God established so that it's not me looking at a law and saying, okay, I got to do this because this is what the law says. It's God creating in me a will to do right. I don't have to look at a law and, and decide whether or not I want to do right based on the law. But on the inside of me, on the inside of me, there is a will to do what is right. There's an innate understanding of what right is. Amen. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And see, a lot of Christians, they, 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 they uh, haven't done what God wants them to do, which is to confess the word of God so that the word of God itself gets into your heart and then the will to do right Ooh, is birthed. Yes. The will to do right. You know, whereas before you were on a job and you just pick up a pencil and just put it in your pocket and go home with it, you know, the will to do right won't allow you to do that. You won't even think about picking up a pencil and putting it, even if the adversary tells you, go ahead and pick the pencil up and take it on home with you. You say, no, I can't do that. It's not, it doesn't belong to me. It's on the inside. On the inside, you see. On the inside. You see, there's just something on the inside that says it's not right. It's not right. Yeah. Come on now. 
See, it's just, it's just not right. It's just not right for me to lie. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, it's just not right. It's not right. Even when there's an opportunity, no one else would even know that I'm lying. But the, on the inside, there's not a will to lie. That's just a will to tell the truth. Amen. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? That's not a will, you understand, to stay angry with people. On the inside of me, the will is that I will not be angry with you. So we're talking about God's righteousness now. You see, we're talking about moving to a place where if you know that you struggle with an area, then you know that that's an area where you need the word of God so that the word of God can get in your heart. And that area you won't struggle with any more because the will to do what is right would be there. Are oh, you understanding what I'm saying? See, the will for me to be right with my wife was on the inside of me. The will, you understand, to treat her the way that she needed to be treated was on the inside of me. No longer did I need to look on the outside or ask somebody, you understand, how should I treat my wife? See, because a lot of people, you know, they're, well, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm married, you understand now. How am I supposed to do this? How am I supposed to do that? No, the will you see, on the inside of you, just knows there's certain things you don't do. And when it's done and done wrong, immediately you want to get it right. Amen. Because the will on the inside says, I won't hurt her. I don't want to abuse her. I don't want to mis misuse her. Not because some book told me. You got to understand what I'm talking about here. You see, when we talk about the righteousness of God, we're talking about what comes from the inside out, not what you're looking from the outside to go. I don't need a book, read a book to tell me how to treat my wife. Because the love of God tells me how from the, on the inside. I don't need a book to tell me how to treat you because the love of God tells me that I don't misuse you or, mis, or mistreat you. Amen. This is the righteousness of God. Are you here understanding what I'm saying? See, the love of God, see, unconditionally, you see, and, this, and that, that, that takes a little while to get this on the inside of you, but you got to keep working at it, keep working at it, keep working at it, you understand? unconditionally, you understand, you do something to me I automatically. You don't even have to worry about whether or not I forgave you. I forgave you before you even thought about it. Because the love of God, the word of God says, and it is true, the love of God covers a multitude of sin. So immediately, you understand, the love of God rises up. You're forgiven from the inside. See, I don't need some book to tell me. And this is what God was getting to, you understand? The difference between old covenant and new covenant, you understand? The old covenant was written in tablets of stone. But the new covenant is written in the tablets of our heart. We live from the inside out. I think about some Christians. I'm like, I'm like, how can you be a Christian and you and you think like that? <clears throat> how could you be a Christian and think to mistreat somebody? Amen. Because immediately, you understand, when a thought comes to my mind to mistreat somebody, another thought comes up and say, No, you can't do that. Amen. So I understand that the devil is saying one thing. But God rises up and says a whole nother thing. Are y'all understanding what I'm saying? Well, we're going to look at some things. I'm not even started. 
Yeah. Glory to God. You get over into the righteousness of God, it's a whole nother ball game. Look at Hebrews, the fifth chapter for a minute, because these are things that we need to ponder. When God says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added to you. I, like, I would like to say it like this. All these things will be, will be like a magnet to you. You will attract those things. You will attract because, <laughs> glory to God, because of the righteousness of God, you will attract things that you just thought about. Are you understanding what I'm saying? What did I tell y'all to go? Five. five. Hebrews five. This is big time over here. You get over in the Hebrews, it's big time. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's big time. Hebrews is a big time, big time book. Now, let's start at verse 12. For though by this time you ought to be teachers. Now, he's not talking about um, the gift of teaching. All he's saying you ought to be teachers. In other words, you ought to be able to teach somebody something concerning righteousness. You ought to be able to teach something. You ought to be able to tell somebody about the righteousness of God. You ought to be able to tell somebody about the love of God. And you know, you can't tell somebody about the love of God if you don't have the love of God in you. You can talk about it, but you can't tell them. See, and talking about love ain't really love. See, because you, 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 got, you got to get, um, let me just say it this way, use a metaphor. You just got to get down and dirty with love, the love of God, to where the, where the love of God will not allow you to think certain things about people, but just not allow you to do certain things with people. Unconditionally, unconditionally. I'm not talking about other people now, don't you? See, a lot of us want other people to do what we don't do. Okay. Y'all know what I'm talking about? In other words, you want other people to unconditionally love you. But then when it comes to you unconditionally love other people, it's a whole different ball game. You won't put stipulations on it. Amen. Amen. You can't tell somebody about the love of God that you're not operating in yourself unconditionally. Now you can talk because you heard somebody else say, you know, the unconditional love of God. You heard somebody say unconditional love of God. But in order for you to really talk about the unconditional love of God, you've got to be experiencing the unconditional love of God coming from you. Amen. Because love isn't something that you talk about. Love is an action. Amen. It's something that you do. Amen. Amen. Are y'all with me? Y'all going to sleep up in here. Is it warm up in here? Because yes. I see some eyes closing up. It's warm. Yes. Somebody need to cut the air on because I'm, y'all not going to sleep on me today. Yes. I have y'all stand up. They say it's like a sauna in here. Come on, cut the, cut the air on. Cut that air on. Y'all are not going to sleep on me today. Not with this that I got for you today. I'm seeing eyes close up and everything. No, we'll stand up and shake ourselves a little bit. Get that, get that sleep off of you. It's too early in the morning. All right, now. Watch what it says. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, 
You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And you have come to need milk and not solid food. Watch this now. For everyone who, who partakes only of milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. For he is a babe. He is unskillful in what? The word of righteousness. Watch verse 14. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use, those by reason of what? Use. use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil by reason of what? Use. So if I can't, if I do not put into practice the love of God, if I don't put into practice the unconditional love of God, then I'm not going to be able to discern from good and evil. Because good and evil, the discernment of, of knowing what is right, what's wrong, is a result of putting into practice the love of God in my life. Are y'all with me? Now, you can't do that just by saying it or just by I'm going to do it because if I just do it, what I'm doing is I looked at a book and now I'm going to do what the book say do. Now, what I've got to do is that I've got to take that word, plant it in my heart and allow the word that is planted in my heart, the seed of the word that's planted in my heart to take root and begin to produce in my life. When you take the seed of the word of God, put it in your heart, plant it in your heart by speaking, word is seed, I plant by saying. When I plant the word of God in my heart by saying, and that word now begin to produce, what I used to do, you'll find that what you used to do, you no longer do before, not because you were trying not to, but because the word of God in you has now grown and produced in you the will. Are oh, you understand what I'm saying? The will not to do what you used to do. Are you all with me? That's, uh, I'm going to give you, I'm going to define uh, righteousness for you. S years ago, um, God gave me this, and I've only, I've only heard it a couple of times with uh, a few ministers. But when you look at the word righteousness, and, and, and it's not just one thing, it's, it's uh, a couple of things. Now, I'm going to give you this. And then I'm going to, I'm going to read a, I, I wrote something out that the Holy Spirit gave me also to try to help as well. Now you may have to get the uh, CD in order to really get this in you. But when we talk about righteousness and, and we're defining righteousness, we're talking about what has to be. And all of this that I'm talking about is according to God. And I'm talking about according to you. And don't know what has to be. See, there are some things that have to be in order for God to bless you. In order for you to get over into this where God just adds stuff to you. We're so we're talking about what has to be. That's A. B is what is proper. What's proper? You know, there's an order to everything. Amen. God is a God of order. Yes. What's, 
what's God's protocol? Y'all understand what I'm saying? See, a lot, of, a lot of times we just do things. We don't even understand the protocol of God. So what's proper? In other words, the thing that sets things in order. What's proper? You see. You know, certain jobs that you're on, you understand, there's, a, there's an order. To, it's, it's what's proper. You just don't do certain things. You know, you just don't walk up in your boss's office. You know, I, I, you know when I was managing, you understand, and um, my doors closed. And, um, you know, I had, to, I had to let some folk understand. You just don't walk up in my office without knocking on the door first. And me, and me then uh, offering you to come in. You just don't walk up in my office. That's not proper. Now, everybody don't know that. Depending on where they come from, they just bust right on in. And so, you know, the first time you understand, because, yeah, you, you know, I got tight in the jaw. You know, back then, I was different. You understand what I'm saying? I was different. So, you know, I just, you know. Ah. You get tight in the jaws, you understand? Somebody walk up in there, you look at them, you gritting your teeth. You got to be out your mind. <laughs> so the first time they do it, you understand, you just kind of politely tell them. Make that your first and last time. <laughs> that you just walk up in my office without knocking on the door. So they understand, you understand, that they are totally out of order. But then some people don't even hear that. Mm. And then the next time like, they walk up in there, you know, and you've already told them one time, then yeah, you have to berate them, you know, you just, hey, I told you don't do that, get out. Get out. Get out of my office until you, until you understand how to come in my office, get out. Then don't come back in here again. So we're talking, no, see, some of y'all bust up in the heaven, try to bust up in the heaven that's like that. See, y'all don't understand what I'm talking about. Some of y'all just, you know, God has told you the way to come to heaven, the way to, how do you pray? Our Father, who art in heaven. You don't start a prayer to God without Father. Y'all just going to start talking. Jesus said you never come to him, you go to the Father in my name. That's proper. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? That's proper, you see. So we're talking about what is proper. And then the last thing is, what is customary? In other words, it just should be something that you just automatically do. You just know this is the way that it's done. It's just done this way. We don't do it no other way. This is the way it's done. This is the way we do it all the time. You know, the Word of God says, and we always want to change things. We, we, we got to see this new, that new, and all this kind of thing, but the Word of God says He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. But yet and still, we got to see something new. <laughs> When we gonna change this? We've been doing this too long. Come on, teach. Some things with God, you won't change. Come into his courts with thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. Into his gates with thanksgiving and in his courts with praise. You ain't coming in no other way. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, this is the way that he told us to come in. Are you all understanding what I'm saying? So it becomes customary and you won't change. Okay, I've been doing this too long. You won't, you won't come in a different way. He hasn't changed. 
unchanged. You know, we sing songs. Hello. Hello. <laughs> and we get tired of songs. You know why you get tired of songs? Because you're not listening to what the song's saying. See, if you listen to what the song is saying, you don't get tired. You only get tired when you're not listening and understanding the words of the song. When you understand the words of the song and you know that you're talking to God or you're singing to God or you're singing the Bible, you don't get tired. Amen. See, we have to teach our young people how to worship God, how to praise God. But we can't teach them how to worship God or how to praise God if we're getting tired. Are oh, you understanding what I'm saying? And, and you know, I, I don't even like to use it, but I, I use it so that you understand exactly what we're doing. But old school. See, to me, there's no new thing under the sun. That's what God says. So there's no such thing as old school. Everything ought to be fresh. The, 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 the next time you sing, the song that you sung this morning should be fresh. Amen. It shouldn't be, you know, well, we just sang this song. No, no, no. Every time it comes out of your mouth, it should be fresh. If, in fact, you understand, it's to God, every word that we say to him should be fresh. Amen. There's no such thing as getting tired of saying the same thing to God because if he not tired of hearing it, you shouldn't be tired of saying it. You all understand what I'm saying? I tell you what, when you get this word in you, when it really gets into your heart and it really begins to do something, you understand exactly how fresh the word is. I can read this. I can read a sentence one minute, come back over and read it again. It was fresh the next minute that I read it again. That word is, that word stays fresh. And if it's not fresh to you, then that means you haven't gotten it. Amen. Are you hearing me? Yeah. All right, now, so listen to this then, all right? I gave you the three things that righteousness means, what has to be, what is proper, what is customary. These three principles which define righteousness are understood better in this statement. <clears throat> what has to be can only be found in God as it relates to what is proper for man based on God's original standards. These standards should be what is customary to man. We can only realize this as we live by faith, being led by the Spirit. I know it's a whole lot. I'm not going back over it again. They got CDs in the the bookstore, go in there and buy the, buy the CD and listen to it and listen to it and listen to it until you got it. Because this is what you need to get. You need to understand righteousness of God. And then you'll, you'll want to get this in you. Now, let's look at some things. The new covenant is God's promise to make us what he wants us to be. In other words, <clears throat> it is a covenant of righteousness. The new covenant is a covenant of righteousness. I want to go to several passages of scripture in my last few minutes here today. Ezekiel 11 chapter, verse 19 and 20. We can see God understood from, uh, from the old, from long ago, long before Jesus came on the scene, that there was a challenge with the covenant that he had made with Israel. He understood that the covenant they made with Israel would not do in them what he needed to be done in them. And so in the 11th 
chapter of Ezekiel in verses 19 and 20. Listen to this. He says, then I will give them Well, let's, let's, let's back up just a little bit. Uh, I don't want to back up too much because I'm, I'm keying in on 19 and 20. But it says in verse 18, it says, and they, and they will go there and they will take away all its detestable things and all its abominable uh, abom abominations from there. Okay. The abominations that God is talking about were what the people were doing that was not right, that wasn't proper. <laughs> that they were doing that was against what God wanted them to do. And so then he says this, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them, take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statues, keep my judgments and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Notice what he's saying here. In this time, that, as a matter of fact, in today's time is what he was talking about when after Jesus came, after Jesus provided this way. He said, then I will give them one heart. All of us should have the same heart because it's the same word that recreates our heart. Are you with me? I will put a new spirit within them, born again, take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. I'm going to change their heart. It's not going to be a hard-hearted, you're not going to be hard-hearted people. Don't care about nothing or nobody. And that's the way, y you know, you are before you come to the Lord. You don't care about nobody. You just care about yourself. You don't care who you hurt. You don't care if you hurt anybody. You don't even care. Amen. So I'm going to give them a heart of flesh. Verse 20 says, that they may walk in my statues. So this thing has to be in your heart in order for you to walk in his statues. You can't walk in his statues because you read them off the pages of the book. It's, it has to be in your heart. It has to come out of you. So a lot of people try to do the Bible instead of letting the Bible do them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, we, we look at what's in here and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to love you. You know, and we read down through chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians, you understand? Take, keep no record of wrong and all those things, you understand? So you're constantly conscious of whether or not you know you doing it. Well, let me just say this. When it comes out of you, when it's on the inside of you, you don't keep no record of wrong because the will to keep a, keep a record of wrong is not even in you. And it's you forgiven and forgotten. You become like your father. He forgives and he forgets. It gets in you like, like that. Amen. Are you all with me? He says that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments. Keep my judgments. Man, and do them and they shall be my people and I will be their God. Let's also look, I got a, I got a few of these to look at. So I'm trying to get through them. Look at chapter 36. Say out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. But God has, has given us this. He's let us know that this is what he was all about. Amen. Now chapter 36 says, in verse 26 and 27, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh, give you a heart of flesh. 
I will put my spirit within you and what? Cause you to walk in my statutes. Cause you to walk in my statutes. He didn't say, I want you to walk in my statutes. I'm going to cause you to walk in my statutes. God will cause you. How is it done? By the new spirit. New. Now, uh, I don't have really time today, today, I don't think, to get it, but I think over in John 6, 6, 6 or 3 or something like that, Jesus said, my word is spirit, my word is life. So it's the word of God when you get it in it, that spirit to do, to cause you to do. It's going to be in you because of the word that is planted in your heart. And that word planted in your heart will cause you to walk in his statutes. Amen. Are you with me? He says, I'll put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. That's, that's talking righteousness right there. You see, that's righteousness talk. Are y'all with me? Okay. Let's look at uh, Jeremiah 31, 33. Y'all all right? I know this might be a little heavy, but sometimes you have to get heavy. Amen. In uh, chapter 31, 33, Jeremiah, it said, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. So we can see now he's talking, all of what he's talking about is a covenant, a new covenant, not old covenant, but a new covenant. Watch this. He says, now I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. We talk, that's covenant talk, you understand? That's covenant talk, you see. And when we join in with the covenant that God has made, then we begin to confess the word of God because we understand what God has said. If we confess his word and the seed of his word gets in our heart, he's going to cause the seed of his word that's in our heart to do something in and through us. He's going to cause us to walk in his statutes. And it's something that you're going to have to try to do, you understand? Because people go around trying to act like God, trying to do what God has said in the book. You understand? All you've got to do is to operate in faith. Faith is me speaking. According to uh, 2 Corinthians 4.13, I believe, therefore I speak. Are you with me? Because I believe what, I'm, what God has said right here. I speak. And so when I speak, you understand, then the word is planted in my heart that will cause me to walk in his death. We're talking righteousness now. Yes. You see, if you ever wanted to do what God wants you to do, if you ever wanted to be what God wanted you to be, begin to confess his word and God will cause you to be what he wants you to be. Are you hearing what I'm saying? It's the confession of his word that gets in your heart that God now works on, that he produces a harvest from and will cause you to now walk as he declared that you would walk. Are you with me? Okay. My goodness gracious. Let's also look at, um, let's go, man. Ah, yeah, yeah. Let's go to Hebrews 8. 10. Because he, because it's brought over into the New Testament, of course. And in the New Testament, he tells us the same thing. He just pulled it over in here. Amen. In the eighth and the tenth chapter of, of Hebrews. And I'm, I'm just going to begin reading at verse, uh, oh Lord, verse seven says, "Well, if that first covenant had been faultless." no place would have been sought for a second. In other words, the first covenant couldn't do what God want, was making this covenant to do. Are y'all with me? Because finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue 
in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now notice what he says there. See, he, he got upset with them because they wouldn't do what he wanted them to do. He says, but I'm going to make a new covenant with them. He says, verse 10 says, for this is the covenant I will make with them in the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind, write them in their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. And none of them shall teach his, his neighbor or none of his brothers saying, know the Lord. For all shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. See, everybody want to, t want to tell you about God. But see, nobody can tell you about God. God has to, God has to witness to you himself. See, I can, what I'm supposed to do is to take you to the grass. Take you to the water. See, you don't, you don't, you can't make a sheep eat. You just take them to the grass that they're supposed to have. You can't make them drink. You just take them to the water that they're supposed to drink. It's up to you, you understand, to eat or to drink. Only thing I can do is to show you from the scripture what you should do. Now it's up to you to do it. Are you with me? So what he's saying is that if you do, if you, if you partake of this, this is what I will, this is what I'll do with you. I will cause you to walk in my statutes. Ooh, come on, somebody. Y'all ought to be happy about that, you understand? Now you can stop trying so hard to be what God wants you to be. All you've got to do is by faith, speak the word. Speak the word. Confess the word of God. And your expectation is that as you speak the word and the word gets in your heart, God's going to cause that word to produce in your heart. Oh, come on, somebody. Do you understand what I'm saying? See, we, the church has been struggling, trying to do what God wants them to do. You understand what I'm saying? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it. I'm trying, I'm trying to make it. And everybody in the church is struggling, trying to do what God wants them to do. And he's letting you know right now, you don't have to do that. All you've got to do is to speak the word only. Amen. <laughs> Woo! And when you speak the word, you understand, then God says that word will be planted in your heart. And then that word planted in your heart, according to the fourth chapter of, of Mark, he says, we sleep night and day. We get up night and day. We don't know how it's producing, but we know it's going to produce a harvest in our life. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Yeah. The next thing I know, you understand, the will to love is there. The will to forgive is there. The will, you understand, to help you in anything I can help you is there. You understand? Whereas before it was a struggle because you're looking at the person. We look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen, because the things that are seen are only temporary. The things that are not seen, those are the things that are eternal. Come on, talk about it, talk to me. Huh? I gotta stop. Thank you for tuning in to today's Reigning in Life Through Faith broadcast. If you're in the DC metropolitan area, Dr. Mills invites you to join our encounters every Sunday morning at 9.30 a.m. and every Wednesday evening for our 7.30 p.m. Bible study. If you cannot join us, we invite you to visit our website and watch us live at agapeembassy.org. Like or follow us on our social media pages for up-to-date information on what's happening in the ministry and encouraging posts that will bless your life through the week.